So we have that here. Transcendental Aesthetic is section two. And section two is just section four. So it's an interesting thing. We have one, two, three, that was space and now time. You get a metaphysical exposition of the concept of time, but there are challenges there. And once again, he suggests that time isn't an empirical concept that has been derived from any experience for neither coexistence nor succession would ever come within our perception if the representation of time were not presupposed. Now, presupposed is underlying them a priori such that we could say that's simultaneous or we could say that's one after another. And we're able to do that because we're able to order experience uh, in time in terms of simultaneity or succession. That has to be possible because that representation can't be uh, experienced in advance because how would we know it? And it's a very important claim. It's not an empirical concept. It hasn't been derived from experience. Same argument form that he used to discuss space. And he goes on. We have here a uh, simultaneous time, a kind of Albert Dolezal, that is 1995. It's a lithograph print. And the, 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 we continue this little grayed out now, so you can see that I'm just continuing the paragraph, only on the presupposition of time, only by presupposing time. Can we represent to ourselves a number of things as existing at one and the same time? That's again, that's simultaneity, or at different times successively, one after another, earlier, later and so on. So the claim then that is made is that time is a necessary representation that underlies whole intuitions, and therefore we're not able, although we could abstract and abstract, as he su su suggested, from experience removing various qualities like hardness and color and so on and so forth, think that away. What we can't think away is space, and we also cannot think away time. So he says we can't remove time itself, although we can think of time with kind of endless time, a desert of time, time with nothing but time, time as void of appearances. Thus, he's able to conclude, he's proven, that time is given a priori. And that is really, in the, with this, he's kind of done with his transcendental aesthetic. He's done it. He's now been able to show that. But now he elaborates that in it alone. Is actuality of appearances possible at all? So appearances may all of them vanish, but time, because time is the universal condition of their possibility, cannot itself be removed. So there is no way to think of a time outside of time. Because if we thought of a time outside of time, we find ourselves in the beginning once again of Augustine's reflections on time in the Confessions, we'd have to be thinking of a before, and, and that's temporal. Or we would have to be thinking of a time after time, but that too is temporal. So time cannot itself be removed. This is, of course, a certain vision of visions and its uh, representation from show and so on and so forth. Uh, but what's meant is this three now, once again, and in the parallel to the reflections on space continue, the possibility of apodictic, apodictic in terms of necessity, principles concerning the relations of time or axioms of time, things that cannot not be, things that must be, apodictic, this in general is also grounded upon this a ah, priori necessity so that time is, if something is going to take place, it necessarily is going to take place in time, but it only, that can only be the case because it's the condition for the possibility of experience. It's not contingent, it doesn't depend. So time, the, the key obvious thing is only one dimension, space three. We, we already saw that with respect to two. Uh, the argument with regard to geometry, but here a, there, there, are, there are some nice analyses of Kant and arithmetic that grow out of this, but in this case, he's only talking at this point about time. One dimension, different times are not simultaneous, but successive, just as different spaces aren't successive, but simultaneous. So you have spaces and spaces blocking out one another, but time doesn't work that way. You have the present moment and the present moment which presences out of the future and passes away into the past. That moment is 
are not able to be retained, but it is in line with the future from whence it comes and the past into which it flows. So various understandings of time, time past, this is obviously an old, old, old clock. No one uses clocks. And you can just tell looking at this clock that it probably has stopped. These principles, he goes on to say, can't be derived from experience. And the same reason he gives. He's not able to, to, to derive them for, not because it's a challenge to you to do it. You can certainly imagine that you've done it. it. You can pretend it to yourself or think to yourself. But the point is what you wouldn't get, even if you were to derive it from experience, even if you could derive it from experience, would be anything that wouldn't be on the basis of experience. And what's on the basis of experience is simply contingent. It's not universal, not strictly universal what he's calling here strict universality, and it doesn't give you any kind of apodictic certainty. It may give you habitual certainty, it may always tend to go that way, but not with necessity, and that's this apodictic, which is logical security that he's looking for. And so this, probably the most famous uh, quotation from the transcendent, in this case, transcendental aesthetic is this, we should only be able to say that common experience teaches us that it is so, not that it must be so. And it's in that must that everything resides. Because that's what Hume challenged, right? Hume says, here you have cause and effect, here you have something which we say is the cause, and we suppose that that cause produces something that we say is the effect. But what we never really see is that the one must follow the other in such a way that the cause engenders or creates the effect as an effect of that cause. We see succession, says you. We see constant conjunction, perhaps, maybe universally or near universally constant conjunction. What we never see, Hume says, is that it necessarily must be so and cannot not be so. And that's what we would mean for the apodictic. The apodictic would be something that cannot not be so. We cannot say that A is not equal to A, except on pain of unsaying what we said, of contradiction, because identity, the principle of identity, simply tells us that A, being A, is A. If you have A, you've got A, and it has to be. It cannot not be that A is identical with itself, being A. Perhaps A corresponds to nothing in the real world, but if we say A, then what we are saying is A. It's a matter of repetition. It's tautology, but it's certain. And that's what we don't have when we speak of cause and effect. We don't have that kind of certainty. Five equals five, A equals A, A is not equal to non-A. All of that will be examples of apodictic certainty, not in the case of of of, of things derived from experience though all we have then is common experience it's always been that way it's always happened that way it's always been so and that is only a matter of what is and not a matter of what must be so he goes on to clarify summarize section four uh pardon me number four here uh, the time is not a discursive or what and this is the, 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 the key notion here, what's called the general concept. It's a pure form of sensible intuition. And so is space. Space, too, is a pure form of sensible intuition. It's pure form. It, 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 it's going to be in as such a form. It will be differently fulfilled in different times, different occasions. But it, it is available in advance such that if we have an experience, we know before we know anything else that it will happen in time if it happens at all. So different times are but parts of one and the same time and the representation of which can be given only through a single object is intuition. So we know, for example, that there's also that continuity. When I'm in London, and uh, time here in New York is eight o'clock and time in London is one o'clock, uh, I am very much present right? at the same time, but of course, later time in terms of the, of, of the day and the night, but it's the same time. Now, I don't know if I went to that, that we, don't, we don't wanna skip that particular point because his point is that the claim the claim that different times can't be simultaneous is not a matter of derivation from a general concept. It's rather a synthetic 
proposition. It's a synthetic judgment. And that means that it's given to you in terms of the intuition and representation of time so that you actually have some new information. You can, you can write an episode of, of, of Doctor Who. So the infinitude of time signifies nothing more than that every determinate magnitude of time, he goes on to say, is possible only through limitations, delimitations, we could say, of one single time that underlies it. The original representation of time as time as such has to be given as unlimited, but when an object is so given that its parts and every quantity of it can be determinately, this represented only through limitation, then the whole representation can't be given through concepts since they contain only partial representations. But on the contrary, such concepts must themselves rest on immediate intuition. You must have this initial orienting pre-given sense, and you do. It's not a sense, but it's a, if you like, pure form. Uh, <clears throat> to go on. We're talking now of the transcendental exposition. This is now section five of the concept of time on change. Anything, anything, anything that involves alteration, becoming, could be another way that we would speak of that. And along with it, the concept of motion as alteration of place is only possible, and this is important, in and, through and in the representation of time. And if this representation, he clarifies, were not an a priori inner intuition, no concept, no matter what it might be, could render comprehensible the possibility of an alteration, that is, of a combination of contradictorily opposed predicate. I put that in yellow for a reason, in one and the same object. And that's fairly important. So that wouldn't be the being and the not being of one and the same thing in one and the same place. Now, that's where he's coming from. And we're not really, as he says, able to do that because only in time, can two contradictorily opposed predicates of before and an after meet in one and the same place, namely one after the other? So succession. Our concept of time explains the possibility that of that body of a priori synthetic knowledge. Go back to this example, right? And we're talking about various physics examples of, of, of uh, time and distance and obviously force. Uh, but our concept of time explains the possibility of that body of a priori synthetic knowledge, which is exhibited in the general doctrine of motion, which is by no means central to the whole notion of acceleration, force equals mass times acceleration, and so on. So he's really referring to Newton there. Time then isn't something which exists of itself. Or, this is important, it inheres in things as an objective determination. It does not therefore remain when abstraction is made of all subjective conditions of its intuition. Were itself subsistent, it would be something which would be actual, and yet not an actual object. There'd be a thing called time. You could encounter time like encountering death, encountering space. And that's not really something that you're, that, that you're going to do. It's really, again, once again, a condition for, of, of the possibility for experience. So again, he proceeds, were a determinate nation or an order inherent in things themselves, it couldn't precede, come before the objects of their condition and be known and intuited in advance a priori by means of synthetic prop propositions. But this is possible if time is nothing but, this is the definition, the subjective condition under which alone intuition can take place in us. That being so, this form of inner intuition can be represented prior to the objects and therefore a priori. So he goes on to say it's nothing but the form. That means the form of the inner sense, which would be your inner sense of uh, yourself, your appreciation, apprehension of yourself, that is the intuition of ourselves and our inner state how I feel, how I feel now, how I felt before. It can't be determination of outer appearances because it doesn't have anything to do with shape or position, but the relation of representations in our inner state. I saw this then, and then this happened, and then that happened. It's also narrative structure, which is one of the key things uh, that is part of this. And because the inner intuition yields no shape, we attempt to make up for this uh, uh, because we, uh, uh, this lack, uh, by using analogies. So there's the arithmetical connection. We represent the time sequence by a line progressing to infinity in which the manifold constitutes a series of one dimension only. And we reason from the properties of the line to all the properties of time, which is an interesting kind of limitation, intuition, 
or the linearity of it, with the exception that while the parts of the line are simultaneously, you can see them. You see the minus two along with the two, no problem with that. You see the five. So you've, you've got, if this were past, present, and future, these things would be simultaneously all given at once. This would be eternity. But in fact, the parts of time are always successive. They take place in the order of time, as we often say. So that means that from this fact, the relations of time allow of being expressed in an outer intuition, and it's evident that the representation is itself an intuition. So we have that. We have different ways of trying to, to, to represent time, but the problem with all of those is that it's a static present, and therefore what's missing in this image is, of course, time past or prior and time to come or subsequent or succeeding. There's a standard vision to ourselves of what would be, if you like, infinity or eternity, except that this is spatial. And this spatiality is not, in fact, temporal. Every bit of this railroad track is present. In fact, we would say, and this is one of the great problems of the parallel postulate in Euclidean geometry, we would say that we know that however long these parallel lines are extended, they're never going to meet, no matter how far one goes. And of course, if there's a curve, one we're going to think maybe, maybe the might and so on. Good question. And certainly right there at the event horizon, they surely seem all ready to meet. But we know that they don't. And that's a trick of our eyes. But that means a trick of our representation of space in our visual sense, visual apprehension of it. So here we are once more this time. The formal, he says, this is Kant. A priori condition of all appearances whatsoever. And then he goes into a little clarification back to his own example of space. Quick summary, pure form of all outer intuition, intuition of things that take place in the out exterior to us is so far limited. And this is a very important thing as we remember. It serves as the a priori condition solely of outer appearances. But this is not the case for the inner of course, because all representations, whether they have for their objects, outer things or not, belong in themselves as determinations of the mind to our inner state. And since this inner state stands under the formal condition of inner intuition and therefore belongs to time, time is an a priori condition of all appearance whatsoever. It is the immediate, he says, condition, if we look at that, of inner appearances. And that just clarifies what we said in class. This corresponds to our souls. This corresponds to the way we are as living beings in our experience. And therefore, and thereby, the immediate condition of outer appearances, which happen then in time, one thing as we like to say, uh, sometimes humorously, after another. Just as I can say a priori that all outer appearances are in space, I know that in advance that if any appearance is going to be encountered by me, even if I haven't met with it yet, it'll be spatial. And it determined a priori in conformity with the relations of space in the same parallel way I'm going to be able to say from the principle of inner sense, and that will also be my uh, app apprehension or apperception of my own consciousness of that experience or awareness of my internal state, that all appearances that I'm judging whatsoever or objects of the senses that I might have and might be forming a judgment on are in time and necessarily stand in time relation. If something is going to happen, it's going to happen if it happens at some time. If you're going to meet uh, the love of your life or some important person, you will meet them at some time, whether that be a time past or time present or time to come. It'll be in time or it won't be at all. And even that is, of course, a modification of being in time. Never, never happened. I could say, oh, I've never met that person. And one can regret that or one can muse on that. So it has objective validity only in respect of appearances. These being things which we take as objects of our senses. It's no longer objective, he says, if we abstract from the sensibility of our intuition. That means from the mode of representation, which is peculiar to us and speak of things in general. That's again a reference to the noumenon. That's again to things apart from our way of apprehending them, experiencing them, relating to them, but as they are apart from us. But Kant's point here is strange. He's saying 
that the object, which you could say that should be the thing in general, it isn't. What he means is the object, to be an object, has to be an object for us and therefore can only have objective validity with regard to the phenomenal realm. That is, in respect of appearances, that allows him to conclude that time is a purely subjective condition, once again, of our human intuition, which is always sensible, that is, so far as we're affected by objects, and in itself, apart from the subject, time is nothing. Nevertheless, in respect of all appearances, and therefore of all the things which can enter into our experience, time is necessarily objective. So he's got both a play between the subjective as a purely subjective condition, and of course, once we've got the condition of that possibility of experience, it's necessarily objective. Very interesting. So this gives us a graphic of time, but it is it, it allows us, this is again a spatial graphic rather than a temporal graphic. You're going to see this as a kind of image, and plus there's space in the background. We can call this the space time image here. But here's a, here's a, here's a clarification then. We're not able to do that. There may be, notice this leaves a kind of door open to the deity and rather also to parallel universes and to a certain extent to different temporalities. We, if you want to call them temporalities, we cannot say, we cannot judge, we cannot claim that all things are in time. Because in this concept of things in general, we're abstracting from every mode of their intuition, if you see that on that second line, and therefore from that condition under which alone objects can be represented as being in time. So here the question is, whether all things are in time and the claim, because we've got to then be making a claim for all things and therefore going far beyond our experience. If however, this is a different trans, see the, the, the second part of that, of that quotation, B52, if the condition be added to the concept, and if we say that all things as appearances, that mean, meaning as objects of sensible intuition are in time, then the proposition has legitimate objective validity and universality a priori. And at that point, in terms of our sensible appreciation, anything that we can apprehend for our senses, for our, that can be an object of our sensible apprehension or intuition, that with objective validity and universality a priori can be said to have to be, to have to take place in time. Nothing's taking place out of time. Nothing's taking place before. So what he says clarify is maintaining is the empirical reality of time, its objective validity in respect of all objects which allow of ever being given to our senses. So he's talking and limiting what he's claiming only to sensible objects. And obviously our intuition, he began, that was the very, very beginning of the transcendental aesthetic, is always sensible. No object can ever be given to us in experience which doesn't conform to the condition of time. There's, you could very interesting challenges to try to think of an object given to us that doesn't conform to the condition of time, that is not under this restriction or limitation or condition. And of course, I think you'd find that you wouldn't be able to do that. This is a graphic representation. I said time, you seem to have a certain number of infinity movements here, but is it space a different question? So he goes on, this is A36. Uh, we deny to time or claim to absolute reality, that is deny that it belongs to things absolutely as their condition or property independently of any reference to the form of our sensible intuition. Once again, properties belonging to the, um, the noumenal realm, things that belong to things as they are apart from us, aren't going to be things as they are for us. So things that are given to the senses are things that are experienceable by us in the sensible realm what things might be apart from what we can sense, apart from what we can experience, is also inaccessible to us. We cannot speak about that. So he's gonna say you're going to have to deny that to time 
a claim to an absolute reality. So you can't propose it. It's a condition with the positive experience, but you cannot then say it's going to be part of what things might be because you're adding a restriction and a restraint that mayn't belong to it. And once again, that's also a door, a little bit of a door for deity because God himself is going to be outside of time, angels likewise, and various other very transcendental or metaphysical uh, concepts. This then, now kind of conclusion as he would give us, is what constitutes the transcendental ideality of time. And he then, that's a, even he's clarifying it, he takes a moment, so what I mean by this is that if we abstract from the subjective conditions of sensible intuition, which is what he had just said, remember we just went over that, time's nothing, can't be ascribed to the objects in themselves apart from the relation to our intuition in the way either of subsistence or of inherence. Now those are medieval substantive uh, uh, qualifications or predicates, but he's saying that that's not going to be possible with regard to time and what time uh, uh, is as such. So in a way, he's actually giving an answer, going back to give an answer. And there are great relations between this and what Augustine says. We talked about that previously, but at the same time, he's doing something which is very, very much post-Newton. So he's on his way to what we're going to be calling the space-time continuum and really an astronomical or cosmological, properly modern cosmological notion of time. This allows him a kind of grand finale. Time and space are two sources of knowledge from which bodies of a priori synthetic knowledge can be derived. And that's does a great parenthesis here. Pure mathematics is a brilliant example of such knowledge as regards space and its relations. Time and space taken together, the pure forms of all sensible intuition, and so are what make a priori synthetic propositions possible. Time and space, the pure forms, once again, of all sensible intuition. But that means you would need with that form to kind of fill that with experience or matter, material objects with which you would then work up in that way, order spatially, order temporally, but you would be bringing that. And it's because you have that capacity for the, that, uh, if you like, pure uh, form of sensible intuition. You're going to be able to have synthetic oppositions regarding sensible intuition, and you're going to be able to have that a priori in advance of experience. And therefore, that the, the fact, though, though, the, being that they're merely conditions of our experience, our sensibility, our apprehension of our senses, by that same fact, these a priori sources of knowledge determine their own limits. They're going to apply to objects only insofar as we, they're objects of experience. That means phenomenal objects, objects that appear to us. And it's not, therefore, with reference to things as they are in themselves. So the sole field of the validity of space and time will concern and is limited to the possibility of experience. If we go beyond sensible experience, no objective use can be made of space or time. And that's what he means by ideality. And that's why he uses the word one more time. This ideality leaves the certainty of empirical knowledge unaffected for we're equally sure whether these forms, equally sure of it, be careful, uh, whether I'm, I'm equally sure works as well, but equally sure of the same space and time, whether these forms necessarily in here in things in themselves are only in our intuition of them, because that doesn't concern it since we're only then talking about the empirical. So our empirical knowledge is absolutely going to be unaffected by all of the qualifications that we're making about what we can and cannot know about the noumenon, because the empirical knowledge that we have is, is knowledge of the phenomenon, obviously. So it's safe. Now he's, he avails himself of a little criticism. And the criticism that he gives is that if you want to maintain the absolute reality of space and time, be it a subsistent or inherent, uh, it, that means underlying uh, the events that occur, the things that occur in themselves, subsistent uh, in, in them or as otherwise indwelling in them, will come into conflict with the principles of experience itself. Why? Because 
if they decide, which is the way mathematical students tend to go, why do we have math? Why do we have a, a, a kind of apprehension of the natural world such that we can introduce mathematical descriptions and those mathematical descriptions describe the world, then you have a problem because if you maintain the absolute reality of space and time, you have to admit two eternal and infinite, because they're absolutely real, self-subsistent non-entities, because they're not things, space and time, which are there, yet without there being anything real, only in order to contain in themselves all that is real. So you've really got a kind of sort of Russian doll arrangement of paradoxes, and Kant likes those. We're going to talk about them a little bit later, but this is a problem. He continues, of those that he's criticizing, they would be obliged to deny that our prior mathematical doctrines have any validity in respect of real things, for instance, real things in space, or at least to deny their apodictic certainty, because you can't get apodictic certainty, this is Hume's point and Kant agrees with it, in the a posteriori, meaning following upon empirical experience. So that would be a real problem. So in this view, the a priori concepts of space and time are just creatures of the imagination whose source must really be sought in experience, the imagination framing out the relations abstracted from experience, something that doesn't indeed contain what's in general or common in these relations, but which can't exist without the restrictions which nature has attached to them, namely to be limited to experience and sensibility. So, the transcendental aesthetic cannot contain more than these two. So they're just the elements that we're talking about are not many elements, but just two, space and time, space-time. This is evident, he says, from the fact that all the other concepts belonging to the sensibility, even that of motion we spoke previously of alteration of change of becoming, in which both elements are united, a space, and then of course taking up more space, perhaps one, 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 one grows as a child, and so on, presuppose something empirical. Motion presupposes the perception of something movable, F equals MA, once again, the, the physics examples, but in space, Considered in itself, there's nothing movable, not in space, not space as such. Consequently, the movable must be something found in space to experience and therefore be an empirical datum, but space is really going to be apart from that something that is movable. So he's able to go on, the same, arguing that the, for the same reason, transcendental aesthetic can account the concept of change among its a priori data. Right. The, 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 this isn't going to be there. Time doesn't change, but only something changes, a thing that is in time. The concept of time, this presupposes the perception of something existing and the succession of its determinations or transformations, how it alters, how it undergoes uh, of variations. That is to say, what the concept of time presupposes is experience. And that, in a certain sense, has to be given. So, he clarifies, what we've meant to say is that all our intuition is nothing but the representation of experience, of, 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 experience, of appearance, of things that will be phenomenal for us. The things, he says, which we intuit are not in themselves what we intuit them as being, nor their relations so constituted in themselves as they appear to us. And that if the subject, or even only the subject of constitution, of the senses in general is taken away, is removed, the whole constitution and all the relations of objects in space and time, indeed, even space and time themselves would vanish, disappear. So, once again, as appearances, they can't exist in themselves, but only in us. And he's here now referring to objects. Objects as appearances cannot exist in themselves as appearances, but only in us. The appearances are for us, effectively. What? I put that in bold because it's very important. What objects may be in themselves and apart from all this receptivity of our sensibility remains completely unknown to us. This is the noumenon. We know nothing but our mode of perceiving them, a mode peculiar to us, and not necessarily shared in by every being. Think of the supreme being, but also those, those aliens that we spoke of, uh, creatures from Alpha Centauri, or uh, other thinking beings like cetaceans, maybe whales have a different experience of time, but certainly, certainly shared in 
by every human being. So it's really talking of space and time as far as Kant is concerned, is human space and human time, and really the way we experience a human world in space and in time. So then, therefore, he's able to say space and time are its pure forms, sensation in general, it's matter. So he's back to the hylomorphic, he's back to talking about the form, and he's now clarifying what sensation in general, the experiences that we have, will be the, ma the matter. Uh, the form of alone, space and time, can we know a priori? That is to say, we can know that in advance of all actual perception, and that's called a pure intuition. The latter, is that in our knowledge which leads to being called a posteriori knowledge? That's experience, that's empirical intuition, that's the facts, that's what actually happens. The former in here, in our sensibility with absolute necessity. So we know that whatever we're going to experience is going to be, if it's going to be experienced in space and in time, no matter what kind of our sensations may be, the latter can exist in varying modes, in various ways, in space and time. That's going to be necessary. And a posterior experience can change and vary, but again, under that precondition of taking place in space and in time. That gives us a kind of time motion lapse, but of, of, of course, space things in space. He clarifies, this is a counter move against Descartes, it's a counter move against Locke. He says, even if we could get absolute clarity on this, really, really fine, uh, Richard and others have asked uh, very important questions about uh, these, these notions. One moment. If we had new instruments, and that was a, like, a, like a camera, like a time lapse, uh, 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 or still uh, motion, uh, and video arrests so that things slow down and we can see a kind of, of, of day to night experience. These you can see on, on, the, on YouTube everywhere. Kant's point is even if you could get that to its peak, maybe get, get a drone in space time, we should still know only our mode of intuition. That is to say, our sensibility. We should indeed know it completely, but always only under the conditions of space and time. Conditions originally inherent in the subject. Last line, extremely important. What the objects may be in themselves, that's as noumena, would never become known to us, even through the most enlightened knowledge of that which is alone given to us, because what's given to us is nothing but appearance, nothing but phenomena. So here we have some images of Descartes and Locke, this Locke, and Wolf. Uh, very important for you can see that by his wonderful dress. The difference between a confused and a clear representation is only logical and does not concern the content. So all we're doing when we get something that's clear is <clears throat> making it more perspicuous for a logical representation, but we have not added anything to the content or we have not made something possible to be known in terms of the substance of what we know. So, he clarifies, the representation of a body in intuition contains nothing that can belong to an object in itself because it only gives us the appearance of something and the mode in which we are affected by that something. And we're really back to the very beginning where he started. This receptivity of our faculty of knowledge, that is turned sensibility. So we're only talking about what we're able to apprehend by way of the senses. And it's not that by our sensibility we cannot know the nature of things in themselves in any save a confused fashion. I put this in bold because that's really key. We don't apprehend them in any fashion whatsoever. So we don't know them at all. It's not that we know them confusedly. We don't know them at all. If our subjective constitution is taken away, the represented object with the qualities which sensible intuition bestows upon it is nowhere to be found and cannot possibly be found. For it is this subjective constitution which determines its form as appearance. Things have to appear to me in such a way that I can recognize them, and that subjective constitution is really all about myself as the knowing constituting subject, and it is not about the object in itself apart from my way of knowing it. Obviously, I added Nietzsche to this because Nietzsche's critical Kantianism is completely on board with this insight and understanding. But Kant goes on to say, 
we then believe we know things in themselves. I mean, know this in spite of the fact that in the world of sense, however deeply we inquire into its objects, we have to do with nothing but appearances. And then he gives an example, a beautiful, diaphanous example, a kind of wonderfully uh, atmospheric example. Kant was a student of meteorology, that he was kind of a weatherman in his day, wrote theories of clouds and gas over the earth, the movements of the winds. The rainbow in a sunny shower may be called a mere appearance and the rain, the things that you can go call it that, you can say that it's because of all the fraction. Notice how much importance is here on Kant's r relationship with Newton, but also Goethe, because here we're talking about light and prisms. Each little raindrop is a prism of refraction, reflection, and that's why we're able, because of all of those raindrops, to see this light in this way as a kind of natural prism giving us a rainbow across this beautiful, gorgeous, that's gorgeous photograph. But anyway, the rainbow could may be called a mere appearance, and it's correct. If the latter concept is taken in a merely physical sense, rain will then be viewed only as that which in all experience and in all its positions relative to the sense is determined thus and not otherwise in our intuition. But if we look at rain as, as, as an, itself as an empirical object and ask without considering whether or not it's the same for all human sense, whether it represents an object in itself, and then he gets very specific to the raindrops. We can't mean the drops of rain, for these are already, as appearances, empirical objects. You could measure them the way you could measure snowflakes, different in from each one, perhaps, different kinds of rain at different kinds of time. But the question as to the relation of the representation to the object at once becomes transcendental. So we really wouldn't be able to understand it in that way. And we would then realize that not only are the drops of rain themselves mere appearances, but even their round shape, even the space in which they fall are nothing in themselves, but merely modifications of fundamental forms of our sensible intuition. And that the transcendental object, what is the raindrop as such, remains unknown to us. We can't know the raindrop. That's a funny thing to say that we can't know. We certainly imagine we do. We certainly don't pay any attention to things like drops of rain. Though, of course, we should because we should analyze drops of rain, see what's in them, and so on. It tells us something about the trajectory through the atmosphere. So, let's suppose that space and time, he says, are in themselves objective and are conditions of the possibility of things in themselves so that they are objective. In the first place, it's evident that in regard to both, there's a large number of a priori apodictic and synthetic propositions, especially to of space, to which our chief attention will therefore be directed in this inquiry. So he's going to be talking more about space, and we'll see some sense about that kind of apprehension of space as we continue in the text. Since the propositions of geometry are synthetic a priori, and that was the example I gave previously, and because they're synthetic a priori, they are known in advance of experience. They are synthetic, they can bear on and give new information about experience, and they're known with apodictic certainty. So he's going to raise the question, how did you get that wonderful knowledge? Whence do you obtain such propositions, and upon what does the understanding rely in its endeavor to achieve such absolutely necessary and universally valid truths? How does this creature, this naked ape, as the... Uh, ethologist, uh, and biological anthropologist Desmond Morris called the human being, how does this creature get to have mathematical understanding which yields absolutely necessary and universally valid truths? Do we have a time, sort of like a, a lifeline to, uh, to the deity? Some people think so. Kant doesn't want to use that hypothesis. He is like Newton, who says, I have no need of that hypothesis. And Kant wants to figure this out in that same spirit without that. So he's not saying this is a proof of the fact that we're created by God, which is kind of what Descartes sneaks in to Descartes' argument in the Meditations on First Philosophy. So here we have, formerly at Princeton, the wonderful essay worth reading, Hungarian a mathematician and Nobel Prize winner, uh, Eugen or Eugene Wigner, The Unreasonableness 
is, is what he focuses on in the title. It makes no sense. It's magic. It's miracle. How it happens is astonishing. The incoherence, one could also say, the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in the natural sciences. So here the question is, how come we buy the fact that pure mathematics is applicable in a field like physics? And you could say, why is it applicable in a field like chemistry? Or why is it applicable in a field like biology? Which it certainly is. And thereby, what uh, one, 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 what Wigner wants to do is to, is to emphasize that the unreasonable efficiency of mathematics and science is a gift we neither understand nor deserve. He was born in 1902, and he died in 1995. But Wigner's point is, <clears throat> this isn't comprehended. And this isn't something that we ought to have the advantage of. It's a gift. It comes from who knows where. It works, but why? So it's a kind of wonderful skyhook. To go back to Kant's own explanation, there's no other way, Kant says, than through concepts or through intuitions. That's it, either a priori or a posteriori. Those are our two sources of knowledge, through concepts or through intuitions. In their latter form, that is to say, a posteriori, meaning as empirical concept and also as that upon which these are grounded, the empirical intuition, neither the concepts nor the intuitions can yield any synthetic proposition, except such as is itself empirical. And that means a proposition of experience. And that means without necessity, without the absolute universality. And that means you're not going to be able to get geometry out of an empirical encounter with the world. Right? Can't go around and measure with a protractor all the triangles you encounter in order to come up with the various uh, principles of, uh, of, of, of Euclid's elements. Same word that Kant is using. Kant's, Kant's version of the point that Wigner is making is to say that from mere concepts, only analytic knowledge, a priori, judgments a priori, not synthetic knowledge is to be obtained. So he gives an example. Two straight lines cannot enclose a space. You just have two straight lines. You're not going to be able to enclose a space. If you have to have two sections of a bridge, right? You have a problem if you're attempting to build a, a, a fence and you order some fences from Amazon and they send you only two pieces, you won't be able to frame anything, not even a small section of your yard. Try, this is the question of this, this proposition, two straight lines cannot enclose a space and with them alone no figure is possible, that you can call an axiom, that you can take it as a given, but you're not going to be able to get it from the notion of two and the notion of straight line. So how do you get from the notion of two and the notion of straight line what you intuitively automatically see when you realize that if you've only got two sections of a fence, you're not going to be able to construct any kind of enclosure. No form, no shape, no figure. For Kant, the point is not that this statement isn't true, because it certainly is. The point is, how did you get it? How can you possibly know that two straight lines cannot enclose a space? And with them alone, no figure is possible. From the two things that are really, really involved here, the notion of two, the notion of space. So the concept of two, the concept of straight lines as such, we have a bunch of straight lines, doesn't give you this insight. This is an insight. This is an intuition. You see that. You get that. You realize that when you're looking with your, at your IKEA delivery of just two segments of the fence you ordered, you realize that you will have to call them up or send them an email if you can find their email or find their telephone number to ask them to send you the rest of the order so that you can frame out the space you're looking for. Even if it's just another, you can make a triangle. A square will take four. You need four sides for a four-sided enclosure. So take another proposition. Now we go from two to three. Very logical. Given three straight lines, a figure is possible. And try in like manner to derive it from the concepts involved, from the concept of three and the concept of straight line. All your labor is in vain, and you are constrained to have recourse to intuition, as is always done in geometry. And that's how you passed uh, the Regents' exam if you took it in, in geometry. You therefore give yourself an object in intuition. You put together a three sided figure. But a three-sided figure is a figure beyond the notion of three straight lines and the idea of a figure. And turning those straight lines 
into sides. You're turning them into segments. And you remember that that's a very important insight in mathematics where they explain that a line isn't a line segment and so on. So Kant only asks, what kind of intuition do you have? And clarifies that it's a pure a priori intuition, uh, but maybe it's an empirical intuition. If it were the latter, if it were empirical, if you figured it out by experience, you could never get Euclid's elements. You could never get a universally valid proposition something that you could take as an axiom, couldn't be born of it, much less an apodictic proposition. And that is really what we have in Euclid's elements or in a geometry in general, because experience can never yield apodictic propositions or judgments or universally, universally valid propositions. It's only tell you what has happened, not, and, and, and what might happen maybe, gives you a sense of probability, but it will never tell you what must happen. And when you want an apodictic or universally valid proposition, you really do require that absolute certainty of what must happen. So here's our example. Remember math class? Always fun. Equilateral triangle. Three sides. And this, is, this will give us this. We know what that is. Equal sides and equal angles. And this simply follows. And notice you need the intuitions to see this. Same way with isosceles. You've got two equal sides and two equal angles. And then you have the scaling, which no one ever wants, does anything with. It's kind of a disappointment in geometry. But those have no equal sides and therefore or no equal angles. And then you also have the isosceles right triangle, which has some very, very interesting uh, if you're interested in Kabbalah or mystical things and, or music. Uh, Pythagoras and other things, the wonderful relations that are there. We're going to leave these for the moment in the great challenge of the square root of two, because you can see obviously by intuition that that is a matter of, of course, the uh, 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 square itself as a square. Good. You have, therefore, to give yourself an object a priori in intuition. You've got to be able to represent it in your mind and ground upon this your synthetic proposition. If they didn't exist in you, and there does, a power of a priori intuition, and if that subjective condition were not also at the same time as regards its form, the universal a priori condition under which alone the object of this outer intuition is itself possible, this is, of course, what would be the case. If the object, the triangle, were something in itself apart, from any relation to you, the subject, how could you say, though it necessarily exists, that should be an S there, in you as subjective conditions for the construction of a triangle must of necessity belong to the triangle itself. You wouldn't be able to say that. You wouldn't be able to generalize from your own particular conditions to what is the general property of triangles as such, per se. You wouldn't have geometry. Now, that would also mean that you couldn't add anything new. The figure, the idea of the figure to your concept of three lines is something which must necessarily be met within the object. Since the, this object is, on that view, given antecedently to your knowledge and not by means of it. So if therefore space, and the same will be true of time, or merely a form of your intuition containing conditions up for it, that's Kant's point, under which alone things can be outer objects to you, and without which subjective conditions, outer objects are in themselves nothing, you could not, in regard to outer objects, determine anything whatsoever in an a priori and synthetic matter, manner. There's, of course, sorry about that. Uh, obviously a uh, problem with uh, sirens. But you wouldn't be able to do that apart from all of that unless you had this very, very important understanding of space and time as merely a form of your intuition, because that form is what's going to allow you to work things up in such a way that this coherence in terms of what you can predict and claim and construct with regard to uh, geometrical relations. So he's able to say, it's not just possible or probable, but indubitably certain that space and time are merely subjective conditions of all our intuition. Why? Because there's the necessary conditions of all outer and inner experience. And that in relation to these conditions, all objects are mere appearances. They're not given us as things in themselves. Okay, and that's very important. But they're given us as appearances, as phenomena, as things that are possible objects of experience. So we're limited to experience, but that means we can have this kind of certain knowledge of objects of experience because we know the object of experience in terms of these necessary conditions 
of all outer and experience because they have to conform to that we are going to be able to have knowledge of them which is indubitably certain which is what we're looking for what that doesn't give us once again is the thing in itself because a thing in itself can't be known through mere relations and so we can conclude that since the outer sense gives us nothing but mere relations this sense can contain in its representation nothing but the relation of an object to the subject and therefore not the inner properties of the object in itself we don't have access to that he will repeat that again and again how could you you can't but the advantage of not being able to have it is precisely that you can have that access to the knowledge of the object of experience which is what we're looking for here we have of course a hopper sunlight in a cafe the way we might experience things the whole difficulty though is about that interiority these people are alone together uh, maybe they're social distancing in advance clearly they are the difficulty is as to how a subject this is our time again can inwardly intuit itself how do you how does the subject grasp itself how does it apprehend itself as such as an eye and this is a difficulty common to every theory so here he's able to say in appearance the objects even the properties we ascribe to them are always regarded as actually given but in the relation of the given object to the subject such properties depend upon the mode of intuition of the subject this object as appearance is distinguished from itself as object in itself but what do you do about the subject with regard to the subject in itself how is that going to work and that's going to be his question so now he's back to talking about his soul my soul seems to be given in my self-consciousness my uh my, the living principle myself the active I, the identity those the questions of self-identity are right here it would be my own fault if out of that which i ought to reckon as appearance a phenomenon i made simply an illusion and that he thinks is a mistake it's an appearance but that doesn't make it illusory and here we have then him coming to that uh, conclusion for uh, kant this is william blake's not too many years after the writing of the b edition of the a uh, critique of pure reason in 1787 we have the ancient of days which is of course a very newtonian deity measuring setting a compass to the earth uh, out of earth uh, prophecy so our last bit and this may not be of interest to you but it is of interest to Kant because this is a metaphysical concept and he's looking for the possibility of metaphysics obviously so in thinking an object natural theology tries to do this god who not only can never be an object of intuition to us but can't be an object of sensible intuition even to himself we are careful to remove the conditions of space and time from his intuition why because all his knowledge is intuition and not thought which always involves limitations there's no limits but with what right can we do this if we previously made space and time time and space forms of things in themselves and such as would remain as apriori conditions of the existence of things even though the things themselves were removed because what would follow from that is they would be conditions of all existence in general which would make them also conditions of the existence of god and there would be a problem there and that would be unacceptable and here is the aforementioned slide the reference to the extraterrestrials this was promised you can see this on your way from the 50 of uh, 9th street to 57th street uh the various uh i think they're meant to be jokes uh aliens talking to you on what are actually boarded up uh establishments so the mode of intuiting and here's because he is Kant is literally referring to aliens once again he 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 means it when he talks about the possibility of extraterrestrials doesn't have to be he says limited to human sensibility it could be that all finite thinking beings he's going to exclude deity he already said that necessarily agree with the human being in this respect though we're not in a position to judge whether this is actually so but however universal this mode of sensibility may be it doesn't cease to be sensibility there's still senses which means it's derivative intuitus derivativas and this is a very important point not original intuitus originarius and therefore not an intellectual intuition which is going to be and that for those of you who are interested in Bernard Lonergan there's going to be something that he writes about in his book inside here then in pure ah 
prior or our intuition, space and time, we have one of the factors, just one, required for solution of the general problem. He already has a great deal. How are synthetic judgments a priori possible? So that's one of the problems of transcendental philosophy. How can you have judgments that are synthetic a priori? When he says in a priori judgment, we go out, that's not out, but out beyond the given concept, we come in the a priori intrudence upon that which can't be discovered in the concept, but which certainly is found a priori in the intuition corresponding to the concept and can be connected with it, synthesized, joined, connection with it synthetically. I connect. Remember that when Heidegger talked about that. Such judgments, however, thus based on intuition, can never extend beyond objects of the senses, meaning they are valid only for objects of possible experience. Limit, keep your, keep your limits to that, and you're going to be in good shape to read Strawson's The Bounds of Sense, uh, just as we are able to go along with that. This then takes him back to the notion of the noumenon. For this reason also, while much can be said a priori as regards the form of appearances, nothing whatsoever can be asserted of the thing in itself, which may, notice the may, underlie these appearances. And I want to thank you for your attention. Next week, we will be talking about the bounds of the sense.